Hi everyone, welcome to lecture seven, reptile reproduction, growth and development. And as I mentioned earlier, with regard to amphibian development lecture, please make sure you read the reptiles of Indiana, the turtles, lizards and snakes of Indiana books to complement the natural history that you're gonna learn about with the general lecture that I'm talking about today. So I'm gonna stop my camera so that you can see my slides and we will get started. We're gonna be first talking about the major differences between reptile reproductive features compared to those of amphibians. First, we have internal fertilization. Recall back with amphibian reproduction, some have internal, some have external. With reptiles, all have internal fertilization, all have direct development. There's no free living larval stage in, in any case. And then we have the evolution of an amniotic egg which allows respiration and storage of nitrogenous waste within the egg and allows for reptile development to occur on land in much, much drier, although not completely desiccated field sites. So this amniotic egg allowed reptiles to become independent of standing water for breeding. And as we mentioned earlier in reptile evolution, that was one of the most single most important factors that allowed reptiles to diversify, especially during the Permian, during those drought conditions, in, in go into new habitats and exploit new niches. So some of this is a bit review, so I'm gonna go through this a little more quickly. Fetalogenesis is an important process in all egg laying vertebrates. It involves the accumulation of nutrients in the cytoplasm of the developing egg. These nutrients later become the yolk. Now in reptiles, betelogenin is selectively absorbed, a process called penocytosis. I'm not gonna ask you to recall penocytosis, but it's a process where the betelogenin is selectively absorbed by oocytes and enzymatically converted to yolk proteins. Now the first phase of betelogenesis is usually slow with little growth of ova, but during the last phase of betelogenesis, ovum growth is much, much more rapid. So let's talk about the shelled or cladoic egg. Now this shell prevents desiccation and contamination by environmental pathogens. Now, although the eggshell protects the reptilian embryo, it also does impose a slight cost on embryonic growth. And that is that the eggshell limits the size to which can fit inside the shell, which is in the egg size itself is limited by the size and the age of the female, which is something we talked about during the amphibian lecture. But the reptiles can still uh, achieve pretty large lengths and surprising lengths by folding and curling inside that cladoic egg. Now there are three extra embryonic membranes that are formed, the allantois, the chorion, and the amion. And that's all I'm gonna ask you to remember. I'm not gonna ask you to uh, recite what those different embryonic membranes do or where they're located. Just remember that those are the three extra embryonic membranes found in a cladoic egg relative to an, amnio an amniotic egg or unshelled egg in an amphibian. Now during mating, many sperm can reach the surface of the egg, but only one will penetrate the surface of the egg and fertilize it. And fertilization is the penetration of sperm and fusion of male and female pronuclei. We talked about that, no different than what we saw in the amphibians. But in in reptiles, it's always internal, and it occurs in the upper portion of the oviducts. So given that fertilization is always internal, this requires morphological features or copulatory organs in males to deliver sperm in all reptiles. Okay, so this is the major difference that we're talking about. Internal fertilization, now we're talking about copulatory organs. But remember, before the copulation exists, it's always preceded by elaborate courtship behaviors, mating behaviors, which we're gonna talk about in a couple of different lectures. Let's talk about these various copulatory organs. If we're focused on reptile or turtles and crocodilians, uh, the copulatory organ is a penis of spongy connective tissue that erects and retracts via vascular pressure. So you can think about it being structurally similar or homologous to the mammalian penis. Now with regard to squamates, the penis is lost and later replaced by a hemipene. And, 
and the hemipene is, is everted by vascular pressure during copulation and withdrawn by retractor muscles. They are not homo homologous to the turtle, crocodilian, or even perhaps the mammalian penis. So let's take a look at the hemipenis in squamates. And here we're using the snake. So here's the tail of the snake, and there's the anal plate. That scale that has oftentimes a transverse or a perpendicular line. So you can always find the anal plate. And then in males, you can see the paired hemipenes. And not only do males have paired hemipenes in, in snakes, the hemipenes themselves can be bifurcated. So here we see a, a large male snake with the hemipenes everted. Each hemipene is bifurcated. And there's some really interesting aspects about snake reproduction and unfortunately we just don't have time to go into this semester. So let's talk about sperm storage. And we've talked about with amphibians that there's a spermatic spermatheca that's found in the roof of the cloaca. But with reptiles, we also have sperm uh, storage and this delayed fertilization permits females to mate with more than one male. And oftentimes when they're mating with more than one male and storing their sperm, this can result in multiple paternity. In other words, those offspring are all half sieves because they share a mother, but they have different fathers. The sperm storage tubules are located on the upper midsection of the oviducts, not in a spermatheca, like we talked about with the salamanders. Now the mechanism from expelling sperm from these tubules is currently unknown. So we've talked about sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction in our prior lecture on amphibians. But we also have a group of reptiles that have asexual reproduction, but there's only a single type. And that single type is called parthenogenesis. And this occurs when females reproduce without the involvement of males or their sperm. And this can result in entire populations of females that are 100% clonal of one another. Now, when you have parthenogenesis, inheritance is clonal. The female offspring are genetically identical to their mothers. And what the ramification of this is, genetic variation within an individual is high, whatever the genetic variation was in the mother, but among individuals, it's non-existent because again, they're clonal. And I'm not gonna ask you to recall how it happens or where it happens. Just know that it occurs uh, without the involvement of males or their sperm. So again, to put that in perspective, remember when we talked about sexual reproduction, we have genetic contributions of males and females in the progeny. With gynogenesis in salamanders, we have the, I'm sorry, hybridogenesis in salamanders and, and amphibians. We have the males parental contributions are found in the embryos and, but as the progeny reproduce, those male parental chromosomes are excluded. Whereas in gynogenesis in amphibians, the male's contribution is never included. Only sperm is used to initiate cellular differentiation. In parthenogenesis in reptiles, it's entirely colonial. Males are not even part of the equation. Not them, not any part of them or their sperm is required for females to produce all female progeny. We do have examples of that in our whiptails. Uh, we have one whiptail species in Indiana, the six line race runner, and it is a sexual species. But members of that family are sort of the flagship family uh, that are known to undergo parthenogenesis. But again, none of the lizards and or snakes in Indiana undergo parthenogenesis. They are all sexually reproducing species. We talked a little bit about parental care in amphibians. And we're going to talk about parental care in reptiles as well. And remember, parental care is defined as any form of post oviposition parental behavior that increases the survival of the offspring at some expense to the parent. That is known as parental care. And there's a lot more cases in reptiles of parental care than we talked about with amphibians. And there are three major types that I want you to remember. There are pre-depositional, and this in, in, involves the quantity and size of egg components. So the eggshell, protein lipids, and oviparous reptiles, the embryo nourishment comes from the yolk. We know that. And as an example of pre-depositional quality, hatchling turtles and crocodiles have 50 to 70% more lipids than required for hatching and emergence. Okay, so they're providing tremendous resources 
in terms of parental care and pre-depositional. Post-depositional is a selection of best sites. So we know, and you've probably seen turtles digging a nest, and then all of a sudden they might abandon that nest site because something about it is not satisfactory. And if egg placement is greatly influences the survival and growth, uh, particularly the growth rates of these embryos. So the site selected must be appropriate, have the appropriate biophysical environment for proper development, and must provide some protection from predation. And then lastly, we have live bearing, and we're going to go into a little bit more detail on live bearing. So what is live bearing? It's the production of live offspring. Close to 20% of lizards and snakes are live bearers. So what are the advantages of a live bearing reptile? The advantage is in the mobility and additional breeding opportunities, but there is a cost in transport. So it provides the parent more control over the development of offspring than ovivory because the female carries those offspring inside her body. So predation on eggs is non-existent, it's no longer a threat. And now the female can control that microenvironment by which those embryos are developing. And it's thought to have evolved because in some microclimates where the temperature is too cold, uh, reptiles couldn't survive because the eggs wouldn't mature. But if they retain those eggs and the, and the embryo de develop as, as live bearing as many adults, the female can control her body temperature by basking in thermal regulation, and thus provide a suitable environment for those developing embryos. So we have two types of live bearing reptiles, oviparous and viviparous, and we'll talk about those in succession. Let's first focus on ovipary. It involves the retention of eggs for much larger periods of time compared to oviparous species, which are egg laying. The embryos can be supported entirely by the yolk and the embryos do absorb some nutrients through the oviduct. Now contrast that with vivipary. Here we have the transfer of nutrients to developing embryos is through a placenta-like structure. Okay? So those are the fundamental difference between ovipary, which are egg laying, ovovivipary, retaining those eggs for much longer, and vivipary, those embryos are being receiving nutrients through a placenta-like structure. So as we talk about embryonic development, development is direct in all reptiles. Remember, they're not two lived. That's what amphibian stands for, two lives, uh, an aquatic and a terrestrial form. In reptiles, development is direct. The clutch size may be proportional to body size, with egg size also being proportional to body size, meaning and it's a positive relationship. The larger the body size of the female, the larger the size of the eggs, and oftentimes the larger the number of eggs in some cases. All reptiles develop from terrestrial eggs. And remember, this calcified or chlodoic egg did help reptiles move away from being required to be laid in water, but they still need to have a moist environment. So there still needs to be some level of humidity, although it's more important in those eggs that are more leathery than those that are more calcified. Usually high humidity produces accelerated hatching and larger hatchlings. It also requires there to be certain temperature. So remember the development relate, excuse me, the development rate is dependent on the temperature. However, extreme temperatures are lethal. Remember our activity temperature range lecture. Low and high temperatures uh, can decrease or increase metabolic growth respectively. So again, think about it in terms of our ATR. The tolerance range of embryos typically lies within the tolerance range of juveniles and their adult counterparts. Exposure to extreme temperatures is lethal, whether they be cold temperatures or hot temperatures. Let's talk about temperature dependent sex determination. TSD is widespread in reptiles. It's found in all crocodilians, tuataras, and 11 species of turtles and squamates. Now, temperature dependent sex determination occurs based on the average temperature during the second trimester of development and not sex chromosomes. Okay, so sex chromosomes are not regulating gonadal differentiation. It's the average temperature during the second trimester. That's really important. And I want you to remember this particular point. Okay, so remember that for tests and quizzes. Now in general, crocs and lizards produce males at high temperature, but there is some variation. This is a generality. In general, 
turtles produced males at low temperatures. But again, that is species specific, but in terms of general production, males are at low temperatures. The reason for that is largely unknown. But let me show you some data on the red-eared slider, Trachomys scripta. So if you look at the schematic, and I really like the schematic, you will likely see this again. We have the temperature on the x-axis and degrees Celsius and the percent male on the y-axis. So if you look at what proportion of the progeny, the eggs, are being produced as males at low temperatures, 100%. Anything below 28 and a half degrees Celsius is gonna produce a male turtle. Anything above 29 and a half degrees Celsius is gonna produce 100% female progeny. The sweet spot is 29 degrees. So 29 degrees plus or minus a 10th or two degrees, you're gonna get a more one-to-one -one sex ratio. It's gonna produce both males and females around 29 degrees. Anything lower, males, anything higher, females. So we have, we're gonna talk about growth pulses. And this is very similar to what we talked about in the amphibian, or amphibian reproduction lecture. Embryonic growth, is increased when there's abundant high quality food. In this case, it's the yolk. Juvenile growth is much slower because of this unpredictable food source, right? Because now the juveniles have to go find and consume and capture the prey on their own. So it's much less predictable. Therefore, their growth is much slower. It's not readily available like it is uh, while they're in the egg. Similarly, absolute age is not as important as the time required to reach, to reach these major life history events. So there are, the, the life history events differ a little bit from reptiles. So here we have conception to hatchling or birth, sexual maturity, which is the same as, as it was in amphibians, and then reproductive salinity. Remember, some of our reptiles can live an incredibly long lifespan. Think about our box turtles that we talked about when we talked about extant species and diversity of our extant uh, chelonians. Box turtles have been known to live well over 100 years. So let's talk about Reproductive periodicity, also important. How often are they reproducing? As well as, again, reproductive periodicity coupled with longevity. All of these major life history events are really important. And you've already seen this schematic as well, where we have the adult size of various amphibians and reptiles, their age of maturity, and then the maximum age. And again, I want you to think about that relationship of, of reproducing at a small age, at an early age, which oftentimes means you're small, and think about that correlation between female body size and the number of eggs that she can produce. But also think about the cost of waiting many, many years before you reproduce for the first time. So again, I want you to be thinking about that relationship and which of those makes more sense from an evolutionary perspective. Think about the cost benefits of each. You might see that again as a test or quiz question. And then lastly, let's talk about the dynamics of reproduction with regard to mate attraction. Uh, females have a heavy investment in gametes, right? These large ova, which are replete with uh, yolk stores for those developing embryos, allows her to select the most fit male. It's similar to amphibians, but territory is more important because reptiles have a reduced need to leave to breed, right? Because now their breeding season doesn't require them to go find water. They can just lay their eggs on land and that clodoic egg helps minimize dehydration. Courtship, both visual signals are important, but also tactile and chemosensory receptors. So that's really it for the reptile uh, reproduction lecture. The, the next thing you're gonna do is uh, be prepared for your midterm exam. So I hope you review all of the lectures that have been recorded up to this point. All the information on the lectures, including the information from your HERP field guides, are all fair game for the midterm exam, which is scheduled for Friday, November 6th. So hopefully you're, you have time to review the lectures, review your notes, and prepare for the midterm. And until then, we'll see you next time.